Since 1973, the incarceration rate has increased for 35 consecutive years, multiplying by a factor of six by the millennium. 7.5% of the population are ex-felons. So if we add to the current 3.3% of the population um, that is undergoing correctional supervision, we have a much larger uh, percent of the population that has had some sort of contact with the criminal justice system. When one adds children who have an inmate parent, the number rises still more. There are 700,000 that leave prison each year. That's more than the entire uh, population of incarcerated people when that increase began in 1973. This is, of course, considerably more for certain demographic groups, uh, blacks and, and Latinos, for whom disciplinary actions by the state are now routine life events, uh, in the words of Bruce Western. At the same time as we've had this increasing citizen contact with the criminal justice system, um, the rise of the carceral state has transformed governance. We've seen an expanding uh, uh, supervisory role of the government. So that now managing, supervising, monitoring, and punishing criminals is a large part of what government does. And it's increasing faster now than other realms um, uh, so, for example, this is a chart of the declining percent of the population that receives welfare. And this is the increasing percent of the population that is undergoing correctional supervision today. Okay? This, does, this line does not, of course, include those that will ever come in, into contact with the criminal justice system uh, during their life course, which is more like 15% of the population. So that number, it's at 3%, but it rises to 15% once you include uh, uh, lifetime risk. Okay? As Americans received more benefits, social benefits and, and insurance during the welfare state expansions of the New Deal and the Great Society then, and as political inclusion was expanded through the rights revolution, some increasingly saw another form of government intervention. And this changing configuration of government activism is happening as the welfare state is uh, retrenched. You see a historical shift away from penal welfareism, rehabilitation and prevention, and it's occurring at the very moment uh, that a shift away from uh, the war on poverty and welfare happens. Today, government contributes more to criminal justice than to all income maintenance and unemployment expenditures. Our budget for corrections is roughly the equivalent uh, of the entire GDP of Cuba. Okay? Um, and growth in correction spending is it's growing faster than any other type of spending during recent years. Indeed, it's difficult to think of any other state institution that has seen such growth. Um, such pronounced an increase. 11% of the state workforce in California is in corrections. Uh, in that state, they spend $2 billion just on giving uh, inmates health care. Um, with this increasing rise, I, I don't think that those two lines are indeed separable. With increasing imprisonment and incarceration, um, it's increasingly been the case that social policy is happening through the correctional sphere. The core functions of the American welfare state are now being handled by the criminal justice state. You see this at the state level, where states that are spending uh, more on welfare, sorry, states that are spending less on welfare provisions are spending more. That's a direct trade-off into spending more on corrections. And expansions in the correctional sphere are financed largely by siphoning resources away from other social programs. But despite this, and I'm here as a political scientist coming from a discipline um, that does not attend to this dramatic switch, okay, um, political scientists and policy scholars have been slower to evaluate the supervisory role of government uh, relative to its more uh, um, redistributive or social role, even while social policy is but one of the ways that the state acts on its citizens and growth in the former is increasingly being outpaced by the latter. 
So given these trends, I'm asking, what is the impact on state society, on state-citizen relations, on citizens' relationship to government and their sense of the state, given that more and more are undergoing supervisory forms of government intervention rather than redistributive or social uplift? How has the growth of the carceral state, the history of which I deal with in my first project and book manuscript, reshaped citizen-government relations? So the headlining quote that we use on the Punishment Symposium website from Angela Davis is, democratic rights and liberties are defined in relation to what is denied to people in prison. So we might ask, what kind of democracy do we currently inhabit? Now one small way of answering that question, of nudging towards an answer, is to see how the custodial population, wards of the state, operationalize and practice their democratic citizenship. As a window into what effect this development has on state-citizen relations, I explore the views of custodial populations directly. In doing this, and I'll get to the study in a moment, I'm making three primary departures. The first is that I want to focus on, I want to use the term custodial population. I want to get away from looking at incarcerated versus non-incarcerated, imprisoned versus non-confined, and instead use custodial populations understood as those who experience being in the custody of police, never having a conviction, but undergoing repeated encounters with police surveillance, courts, correctional institutions, to encompass the many other ways, the many other punitive interventions that routinely occur in the lives of citizens. Once we include having contact with the criminal justice system that is simply being stopped and questioned by police, the system of social control looks much different. In fact, it looks much larger than is traditionally understood if we only look at undergoing incarceration versus not. The single-minded focus on incarceration obscures the influence of repeated contact with law enforcement. We might expect that those interactions are also indeed consequential in the lives of citizens, especially since arrest is enough for an employer to deny one a job or a housing authority to deny one a Section 8 voucher, and being on probation in some states is enough to ban them from voting for life. So it's not just being confined. We can explore variation in the degree of contact with the criminal justice system. The second departure that I make primarily as a political scientist is that most of the work on how the carceral state affects the lives of citizens is focused on labor market outcomes. What does it do to employment and earnings, which is indeed very important, and I'm building on what those scholars are doing there. But I'm looking at what are the political outcomes of increasing contact with the criminal justice system. I'm not also just looking at felon disenfranchisement and formal barriers to political inclusion. I suggest instead that merely undergoing an arrest or being convicted but never serving any time has an impact on political inclusion and on the civic identity of citizens. I'm arguing in this paper that contact with the criminal justice system profoundly shapes citizens' experience of government. So to expound a little bit on the theoretical framework I'm using, why might we expect that punitive interventions structure the political sensibilities and actions, political activities of those under it? There's two major mechanisms here. The first is that a custodial relationship with the state confers a stigmatized political standing on the group. Policies in the political science literature, we talk a lot about policies infusing groups with political meaning, communicating deservingness or undeservingness, legitimacy and inclusion. Custodial populations are thus sent important signals about their status in the polity. They are not, and we've heard this through yesterday at the symposium, they're not afforded all the benefits of citizenship. Employers are allowed to discriminate based on arrest record alone in many states. Parental rights can be denied. Several states have significant lists of occupational exclusions 
um, that uh, uh, people cannot hold after they've uh, had a conviction. Um, drug offenders are now barred from welfare, food stamps, and college loans. Uh, uh, immigrants who uh, have come into contact uh, can face deportation hearings. Um, they're not allowed, to, convicts are not allowed to serve on a jury. Uh, they're barred from public sector employment, denied public housing, the list goes on. Over 5 million cannot vote now because of their convict status uh, in Georgia. This interesting study by Darren Wheelcock um, found that uh, uh, in 16 counties, over half of the black men, uh, because of a civil penalty, couldn't serve on a jury. Over half of the black men could not serve on a jury in 16 counties. So the logic is this. Being cut off from normal habits of voting, obtaining public assistance, applying for some jobs, this has the effect of reducing their stake in the political system. They confront consistent messages that they're not worthy of normal citizenship. They're excluded uh, from the responsibilities of democratic citizenship. In this situation, then, we could begin to imagine that they remain disconnected uh, from political life and less committed to the political project. Um, they're occupying a truncated citizenship. Now, the second major mechanism <clears throat> by which I, I, I would hypothesize that custodial involvement shapes civic identity um, is that to this population, government is the criminal justice system. When they think about government, the closest proxy, the most intimate form of government contact they come to know is via the police squadron, via the court, via the correctional facility. It's not city hall. It's not the state capital. It's, it's not Congress. Okay? Um, citizens learn about political life through their contact with government agencies. Therefore, custodial populations are receiving their civic education from the institutions of criminal justice. It is increasingly a form of social provision as millions are housed, educated, medicated, given health care, employed, not via normal state in institutions, but through the correctional system, through penal institutions. Parole offices, halfway houses, deliver other services to this population, like job training and employment and drug treatment. So institutions of criminal justice come to represent government to, to residents. Okay? They are the governing institutions with which they have the most knowledge, the most direct contact. <clears throat> they come to be, uh, you know, the parole board, uh, the police station comes to represent kind of a proxy government uh, to this community, and the representatives that they have most contact with are criminal justice authorities. Okay. Uh, denied participation in mainstream state institutions like the voting booth, welfare, the jury. Traditional institutions, positive institutions, recede from view. In fact, Bruce Western has found that more black men born in the late 1960s had contact with criminal justice than with welfare, the military, unions, higher education. Okay. It's also, uh, uh, I also hypothesize that to the custodial population, they see government as one big system. And there's this continuity or slippage that happens in the perception of government that occurs such that, uh, 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 you know, the Department of Child Protective Services becomes no different than the juvenile court to this population. Okay. Um, the contact is concentrated in certain neighborhoods and communities so that for certain demographic groups, this is the primary form of public investment. This is the primary form of government uh, in their lives. So half of D.C. and Baltimore black men are under correctional supervision, right? Much higher than the number that are going to college, okay? So if we believe, if we accept my hypothesis that to this community government is the criminal justice system, what kinds of civic lessons are drawn by this community? To avoid government, to avoid the authorities, Avoid interactions with the state because that usually entails uh, a negative criminal justice interaction. In this situation, we could imagine that this population would feel more apathetic 
more alienated and more withdrawn. They're not going to actively seek out government because to them it's not going to be a positive encounter. Uh, they might uh, practice avoidance behavior, which is exactly what I find. So there's a dual thing happening here. One is the rejection of uh, offenders from normal institutions and simultaneously the internalized need to avoid the state. So going on to uh, what I did to kind of operationalize this and, and study this, um, despite the much greater contact of citizens with punitive encounters, um, we actually know very little about this population. And part of the reason is that as political scientists, they don't show up in our surveys. Um, and we actually don't ask questions about criminal justice involvement. We ask questions about welfare state involvement, but we don't ask questions about criminal justice involvement. We're at a disadvantage because many of our uh, surveys themselves don't ask about custodial history. In fact, uh, you know, the national uh, election study, it's got, you know, 1,500 people. That's not enough, and it's a national sample, and they miss folks that have contact with the criminal justice system. So I go outside of my field, and I find three uh, external studies um, that have been done in the fields of health and, and uh, sociology, and these are the only data that I know, to my knowledge, that exist that would allow one to see exactly what uh, uh, people that come into contact with the criminal justice system um, think about politics, uh, their political behaviors, what, what they're doing uh, in political life. Let me describe them briefly. The first study is the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. It's a, it's a panel study of 5,000 families, and what they do is they interview the mothers and the fathers um, of, of uh, mainly uh, somewhat impoverished, unemployed, unwed families at the hospital in 22 cities, and it's representative of urban populations uh, around the nation, but it's not a nationally representative sample. They're interviewed at the child's birth, uh, and then again at one year, three year, and five years later. I'm looking only at the three-year study, which actually included a battery of questions that asked uh, the mothers and fathers what their political uh, belief systems were, what, how, how often they had gone out to vote. Um, this is a, the study is being done in 2001 to 2003. Um, uh, what's unique about it is that because it's looking mainly at, at high-risk, low-income communities, um, you can isolate somewhat the impact of uh, a correctional intervention. It's one of the only data sets with enough people that have come into contact with the criminal justice system. So what this is showing here, um, I've, I've constructed a measure that, based on several different questions, um, so the population that has no contact at all, the population that reports having been questioned or stopped by the police, not for a routine traffic violation, okay? The, the population that has been arrested, the population that has gone to prison or jail, and the population that has served serious time, by which I define that as over a year in a correction, an adult correctional facility. Um, and what you can see here, much like the population, there's a disparity in the data set itself. Uh, over half of the black population in this study um, has gone to prison and uh, several have served serious time. Okay. Many uh, more people had come into contact with the criminal justice system than in my other studies. So 52% report being stopped by the police. 35% of this study were charged or arrested. 25% were actually uh, convicted in court. And 22% served time, of which 5% were actually currently incarcerated. They were being interviewed in a correctional facility. Um, Many of these, and I should say there's a little bit of a difference here because in this study they asked both mothers and fathers about the father's correctional history. And according to mothers, 39% um, of the fathers in this sample had been to jail or prison. Okay? I use the combined reports of what mothers are saying and what fathers are saying. Um, uh, many had very significant levels of contact with the criminal justice system. 12% had more than one conviction. 8% had been imprisoned multiple times. The average length of time that the fathers in this study, and I'm looking only at fathers, um, the, the average length of time that they had served was 19 months. 
um, and many, of, almost half, were incarcerated uh, for longer than a year. Um, the benefit of this study is that these people are coming from similar situations. There's not a lot of difference uh, in terms of educational access and neighborhood quality of this population. Okay. The only drawback is that I can't control for, I can't account for the spurious factor of criminal history, so criminal behaviors. In the other studies, I can look at, I can separate out actually having an incarceration intervention from one's predisposal to crime. The second study I'll mention briefly, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health. It's also called the Ad Health Study. It follows a nationally representative sample of youth over their life course. It was begun in 1994, but I used the third wave of the study, which is the only wave to actually have uh, uh, political science measures, so uh, beliefs about the political system. Uh, by the third wave, the 15,000 respondents were 18 to 20 years old. Um, in this study, unlike the Fragile Family Study, um, there aren't as many people that are coming into contact with the criminal justice system. Um, it's a much more general sample. Um, of, you know, there are cross poverty lines, there are cross educational attainment. Um, but still, even given that, over 15% of the sample had had some contact, some form of contact with the criminal justice agencies by their young adulthood, and 12% had been stopped. Um, by the police multiple times. And then the last survey um, I use just for a few measures that it has is the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, a sociological study, um, and I use the 2006 Young Adult Study, which contains detailed measures of criminal justice contact uh, as well as political science uh, measures. My findings are split, so, so in this I'm looking at what the five-point measure uh, of criminal justice contact from nothing on up to serious time, what that effect is on four different areas of political participation. The first is voting and how often you participated in political activities like contacting a government official, uh, contributing to a campaign, joining a party, marching in a rally, um, uh, uh, signing a petition. Okay. The second is civic engagement. Uh, how many groups did you get involved with, social community, environmental groups? Um, what was your, your civic membership like? Um, the third is political information. How much do you pay attention to political moves? Um, and then the fourth, and, and I think the, the best measure in this study, is beliefs about government. How much do you trust the, Ameri the federal, state, and local government? three different measures of that. Um, how much do you think that the government, the federal government, actually listens to Americans and does what they want? Okay, traditional political efficacy type questions. This is just showing um, the number of respondents in each of these categories so that you can see they are not trivial, though they differ across the studies, and in fact the total sample in each of the studies is very different. Um, you know, 855 fathers in the Fragile Family Study had gone to prison or jail. I can't emphasize how unique that is to have a study. Um, uh, there is no other study that has that many people that actually asks inmates or asks uh, uh, ex-inmates about their civic identity, about what they think about politics. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get to the findings. What does it look like? Um, so looking at, uh, did you vote in the last presidential election? And excluding those who were actually ineligible to vote, excluding those, that's going to be important. What do we see? In fragile families, over 60% of those who have no contact, not being questioned, not being arrested, not being convicted or serving any time, uh, had voted. That's what it looks like in fragile families. There's a strong relationship between custodial status and voting. With more punitive encounters, you can see, uh, uh, less, respondents are less likely to have voted. Here's what it looks like in ad health. Of the respondents here had reported voting.
voting in the last election, of those who are eligible, of those who are not permanently felony, have felon disenfranchisement. Now, there's a bit of difference between the studies. This is an older population. This is a younger population. Remember, at health folks are only 18 to 26. But the trend is consistent. This is what the NLSY, the National Study of Longitudinal Youth, looks like. And again, they don't have, it's a different measure, so they don't have many of these, they don't have a question on questions you're arrested. Okay, same general trend. Most importantly, the diluted voting strength is not just happening between those who are incarcerated and those who aren't. It's happening at every single level of criminal justice contact. So it's not just confinement that matters. Simply being questioned by the police can lead to a reduction in voting. Participation is most depressed for those with the significant punitive uh, interventions. Um, uh, this diminished participation, I should note, is not, again, due to felony uh, disenfranchisement things. Okay. What are other... I, I want to show this because, actually, before I get there, one common critique might be, well, these people are poor, less educated, more likely to be unemployed, more likely to be destitute. I control for that using several regressions. I'm not going to put up my regression tables, but many of these results remain significant after controlling for past criminal history, after controlling for marital status, unemployment, poverty status, and one way of depicting this visually that I really like. This is separating the, the sample of the fragile family study into poverty status. So those who are at 50% of the federal poverty line, very, very poor, versus those who are 300% and above of the poverty line. It's a way of kind of proxy controlling for um, uh, poverty status. And what we see here is regardless at each level of poverty status, increasing interactions with the criminal justice system is still having the same diluting depression effect on voting. Okay, so it's not poverty status, it's not being unemployed, uh, it's, it's interactions with the criminal justice system. Okay, participation measures outside of voting, these are a, a series of dot plots to represent this most visually. Participating outside of voting, like contacting a government official or working for a campaign or participating in a rally, again, those experiencing disciplinary interactions were much less likely to engage in politics. The level of participation in political life, whether it be identifying with a political party or an index measure of, of political participation, declines with increasing criminal justice involvement. Okay. Civic engagement shows the exact same trend again, similarly defined by encounters with the police or the criminal justice system. Those who experience custody of any kind, from police questioning on down to incarceration, are much less likely to seek out civic society and participate in cultural, social, social or political groups. One of the most interesting, uh, I think, oh, did I not put it up here? Okay, this chart, civic obligations. Civic obligations is a measure of how important do you think it is to vote? How important do you think it is to serve on a jury, to serve in the military, to do things in your community? That measure shows that it's not just that they're like, less likely to engage, they actually have a withdrawal from civic obligations of, of citizenship. Um, right, the commitment to civic traditions in our democracy, like voting and serving on a jury and serving in the military, shrink with growing exposure to the criminal justice system. Another very interesting realm, trust in government declines. So this is a statement of, do you agree that you trust the federal government? Do you agree that you trust the state government? Um, and the percent that strongly disagree um, or, or disagree with trusting the federal government goes from 18% for those with no contact, okay, to 55% who had served serious time. 55% say they strongly disagreed with the statement that they, that they trusted government. 
Custodial status similarly determines respondents' beliefs about how responsive government is to people. Okay? Yet again, people's lives who had been touched by the criminal justice system uh, were also less frequent consumers of political information. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that, that graph up here. Uh, these results are so striking, um, and in the Fragile Families study, because they also ask mothers, right, the spouses of those people who have had contact with the criminal justice system, about their political beliefs, their uh, likelihood of voting, I looked. What is it, does it matter for a mother that her husband or partner, um, that, that she's seen them go, on, go off handcuffed uh, to jail? Yes, their commitment to civic obligations similarly declines across carceral status, custodial status of their husband or partner. I just think that's huge. Uh, okay, we've got to we've got to get going. Um, let me. I just wanted to end by uh, uh, saying that I think that this has two broad implications for kind of. Uh, the carceral state and America, American civic democracy. Um, and the first is that as the custodial as custodial supervision increases, so too will political inequality. Um, so too will withdrawal from politics, withdrawal from uh, uh, our American civic traditions. Um, and that that has very deep and kind of dangerous implications for the kind of democracy um, we currently inhabit, to use your phrase. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you.